Yeah, good morning everyone. I guess most are still hung over from last night. So we are happy to kick off the day. <laughs> I hope everybody's awake. Yeah, I'm Sebastian. This is Hans. We're going to introduce us in a minute. And we are, um, I guess, a little bit off most of the other talks, which are very technical or community driven. But we're instead talking about artistic perspectives, making use of OpenStreetMap data. Um, yeah, I'm Sebastian. I'm a, I work for a foundation in Berlin, and we're doing advoc advocacy for open data and open source technologies for the, the government in Berlin. And besides that, I'm also a freelancer working on data visualization, especially on geospatial data. And okay. Um, hi, my name is Hans Haag. I'm a web developer. Um, work in the field of data visualization, mainly with maps and, of course, a lot with OpenStreetMap data. So a big thank you to the OpenStreetMap community here. Without it, my, a lot of my work would not be possible. So today I'm going to show you some of my work that gives some alternative perspectives onto our environment. A lot of my projects start with a question I ask myself um, that arise from political and social contexts. The first work I will show you today, Reprojected Destruction, came to be in 2017 when the fighting in Aleppo took place and the city got heavily destroyed. I want to grasp the extent of uh, destruction. So what is being talked about in the news? How can I approach this issue as a map maker? So I did some research and I came across an interesting data set from the UN, which showed how strongly the buildings were damaged in East District of Aleppo. This gave me the idea to reproject the data set, the uh, Aleppo's district, onto Berlin and its buildings. As a geographical reference point, I superimposed the historical center of Aleppo, the citadel of Aleppo, onto that of Berlin, the museum island. Then I wrote a script that randomly selects the amount of buildings um, destroyed in each quarter. I published the map, the result, as an interactive map. I also added London, so because that's another place I'm familiar with. So the buildings marked in red, you can see on the map here, show the buildings destroyed had the war waged in Berlin or London. You can also blend in a data layer to see the actual numbers. The project was well received by the press, especially in Berlin, probably because it took something unimaginable to a familiar place. Another example for recontextualizing and taking something perhaps unfamiliar to a familiar place is a work I did for the uh, newspaper Berliner Morgenpost when Trump announced to build a wall along the US-Mexican border. The website allows you to drag that wall along the world to a place that maybe you might be more familiar with so you can get a grasp and understanding what, it, what, what is actually being talked about. The next project I'm going to show you was not about what you see on a normal map, but what you don't see, so to say, to read between the lines. The project arose from a feeling I sometimes have in Berlin that it just seems impossible to get away from a street, from the feeling of civilization, pollution, noise. I also noticed this even traveling around the German countryside. So this made me curious, where can I find a place that is as far away possible from a street? So I downloaded the OSM dataset for Germany from Geofabrik, um, extracted the streets with OSM filter, then I imported the data set into Poskis and laid out a um, raster point layer, meaning like with uh, of, of points in a distance of 200 meters to, to each other. And then I queried for every point how far that point is away from the nearest street. The result is an interactive map made with tire mill and leaflet. So in case you're wondering, the furthest point away from a street in Germany is 
in the North Sea found on a sandbank. And tranquility, if you're looking for it in Germany, you can find in general in islands, mountainous areas, lakes, and military proving grounds. The, um, res the project was well received, and I even got someone that wants to visit one of these places. The last project I'm going to show you is about putting a new light on existing geometries. I am fascinated by the aesthetics of maps, especially building footprints. Maybe, yeah. So I extracted a selection of houses from OSM and just played around with them. So what really spoke to me aesthetically was sorting the building footprints by size. My aim became to optimize this project for large data sets and for example, for, city, for whole cities and city quarters. I therefore made a tool which allows me to do just that and the tool also allows me to, um, to, uh, to select only churches or prisons and so on. What I liked about this project, maybe you can go show the gallery also. What I liked about this project was that people started to look at these images and ask themselves what certain buildings were, um, what their building was, or what the function of that building was, and started to compare like, their city to other cities and rediscovering their own environment. On the website, I also included a tool that lets you sort a small area of the map yourself. So here you can see Milan, like the area where now, the university area, and then it makes you a poster like this. And you can even download it as an SVG and print it out. So I invite you to play around with the tool and perhaps you will see your own area in a different or new light. Thank you for listening. Yes, so my work is um, kind of at the intersection because I'm actually more into the research field, so it's somewhere at the intersection of arts and research. Um, so I was working a lot on mental models. So how do people actually remember the places around them? How do people make sense of the city? How do people find their way around the city? And while doing this research, I came across the, the, Fren the French Situationist movement from the 1960s. And they were much concerned about how we, as human beings, perceive the city, what are our subjective impressions that we get when we walk through cities. And this, for example, is a work by Guy Debord, who was um, living in Paris, per Paris at the time he was doing this. And he created all these great drawings of how he is um, remembering the city, how he's perceiving the city. So I was thinking, OK, is there maybe a way of how we can do this today, but maybe not from this kind of, okay, we, we need to draw these nice images, but maybe there's a data-driven way that we can create these kind of person, personal impressions of how we remember the cities and create these kind of personal images of um, what our own cities look like. Um, so I started collecting some data. I asked um, a lot of my students to collect data for me. And um, at the time, the, the easiest way to do it was the, the, the Moves app. The Moves app was, a, um, um, was acquired by Facebook, sadly, a few years ago and was discontinued just a few weeks ago. So you cannot use it anymore, sadly. But it, it was a nice way because it collects the spatial-temporal trajectories where people walk and it also already does a classification. So is, the, is somebody walking? Is somebody cycling? Is he or she going by, um, by train or by car, etc. So you get this really nice already pre-classified um, data set of trajectories and can use them for further analysis. And so then I came across a really interesting paper. So this is by um, a research group about uh, around Mondschein et al. And what they found out, something that is actually quite obvious. So they were interested how does the, the way you move around the city change the way you memorize the city? 
And obviously, the slower you move around the city, the more you memorize, but also the more self-controlled you move around the environment, the more you remember. So of course, if you walk around the city by your own, then you remember most. If you're on your cycle, bicycle, for example, then you also need to figure out how to get from A to B, so you remember more. If you're in a car, it gets a little bit less because you're passing faster through the environment. And for example, if you're in a bus, so you're not driving yourself, it gets less and less that you actually remember the environment you're in. So I wrote an algorithm to um, implement the, the psycho psychological model that this research group developed and combined it with the um, trajectory data that I gathered through the MOVES application. Um, so the, the MOVES app, over a year time, the, the participants were collecting the data and so also in the back, this, um, the data that I received, I also used a map matching technique to um, actually get the correct streets the people were traveling on, and I also used um, OpenStreetMap for, for the, the street data and the, the map match matching technique. But in the end, I was most interested in um, visualizing this. So my idea was of using the, the buildings, so the actual physical environment that we walk through as kind of a canvas to print our memorization kind of index I developed on. So what we can see here now, for example, is somebody traveling on a road several times and now we can see that the, the buildings around this road are collected and we create this kind of environment that the user traveled through. So in the end I created this, this kind of representation of the city and what we can see here is what I then later called the, the walking islands. So this is the areas that, peop that one person here spent a lot of time in and that they memorize very, very well. So the darker the areas here, the more memorized the area is. And what was quite interesting is that for most participants, they had these, these small islands like splattered across the city and those, those little islands are then connected by, by other types of transportation. So, um, in a second, we should. So now we, we see the, this kind of network developing how those islands are connected. And of course, some islands are stronger connected, some are weaker connected. And to get this kind of situationist expression, I try to then reorganize the city in this kind of network. Because what is quite interesting about these kind of, yeah, loosely connected places is that there's a lot of research that people often don't even realize how these loose kind of islands are connected with one another. So, for example, during the, um, the planning for the Olympics in London, there were some really interesting geographers going into the city and trying to figure out how they can improve the, the navigation system in the city. And they found out that even Londoners who lived there for like years and decades often don't know how two um, tube stations are connected in the, in the real world because they just remember this, this, this famous tube plan and how the city runs. But they often they don't know that, for example, two tube stations that take quite a lot of time because you need to change to another train are actually quite close to another and you could just walk between them. So the, they created these um, interesting maps on the street where they show how far are things uh, to walk um, to just show people that they can actually sometimes walk instead of taking the train. So it's quite interesting to see that people often don't realize how these loosely connected places are actually connected to each other in the real world. So in the end, I um, try to create like a um, more physical artifact for the participants so that they could kind of um, reflect on their own behavior in the city. So I created these big 3D printed um, yeah, city maps. The height of the building again represents the, the memorization index or so how well they know the city. And like looking at those kind of artifacts that the people um, started realizing, ah, okay, this is the area where I do this and that. And so they suddenly um, started memorizing certain events in the city where they travel through those places. And of course, it's not a correct um, representation of the city, but more like a, a very personal artifact that you can create from your behavior in the city. And all this is built on open street map data, so um, all the, the, the little physical um, yeah, artifacts that the, 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 the shape of the 3D print was all taken from the open street map data. And, um, yes, so 
I think to, to kind of sum up and combine um, our talks, we by just challenging how we see the city, because um, especially maps, they don't only help us to, to travel through the city or to find certain places, but they also kind of shape how we perceive our environment. They're often referred to tools of power because they represent um, these kind of yeah, representations of the world that are shaped by us, the map makers. Um, so it's quite, we think it's quite important to sometimes challenge these standardized views of the world and create some new novel um, representations and visualizations, how we can see our environment and get some, some new perspectives. And we're almost at the end. So yeah, one last promotion. Um, maybe you didn't have enough from last night's celebrations. So tonight there will be a little bit of more celebration. Um, um, together, Alzino over there, uh, I'm organizing a meetup in Berlin. And there is, uh, it's called Map Time. And there's also Map Time here in Milan. And so we teamed up. Um, first, there's going to be um, a collaboration with the Polymappers from Milan, which is going to happen at Birificio Lambrate. I hope I did it almost correctly. And uh, later on, we will move to Balera del Orticha uh, for more celebrating. So if you're interested for drinking some more beers tonight, join us. And thank you. So if you have any questions, um, actually most of our work is on GitHub, so if you're interested in reproducing what we showed, there's a lot of code um, on the web, but yeah. Okay, first question. Hi, thank you. Um, I re it seems fantastic and I really liked the um, building Salter and I wondered if you if you would be able to use it in, say, rural Africa, because um, we were talking yesterday about um, what Chad was saying about the problems, you know, working out what this building was, and I wondered if your tool could potentially be used for something like that. Uh, a verification tool. If you analyze schools in rural Tanzania, yeah. quite often they have p particular shapes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> but uh, it's not the main purpose. Like, it's not a verification tool, really. So it's not highly scientific. But I, I guess you could u definitely use it. Yeah, sure. I think you would need more like a... Because in your case, the, the actual shape is more interesting than the size. So it's probably more interesting to look at the, yeah, the actual shape. And for example, if there's a, a courtyard or something, if this is a specific attribute feature of schools. And of course, that could be easily built, um, something like that. Yeah. So you could have a shape typically going for typical school shapes. Yeah. 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 Any other question? I've seen. <coughs> Sorry, somebody. Mm. Okay. Please. I was just wondering, um, how much trace data do you have, and is that publicly available? It's the obvious question. Because having the mode of transport might be interesting to analyze stuff that is missing in OSM or something like that. Uh, what kind of data? But the trace data that you got out of moves, okay. the, the segments. Um, I mean, I got it from 10 participants, for, uh, so it's not that much. And I was also very much concerned about privacy. So I built a kind of standalone system that um, yeah, the, the, the participants uploaded their data on a local machine. The maps and everything was generated, and they could then take it out again. So I didn't even use an online service just to make the participants feel really safe about their private data. because. Spatial temporal data is really hard to anonymize, especially if you have a very, very small um, sample. So it would be very easy to identify the individuals from the data. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I fully agree. I didn't know <laughs> how many users you had. Ten is two orders of magnitude to less, at least. But, de but I think it's definitely interesting to think about ways of um, extending the OSM data set with trajectory data and finding ways to properly anonymize data because this would be a, like a really interesting data set for, for researchers and also for city planners to work with, so. Okay, maybe we have one last question. 
ओके सो हैव अ क्वेश्चन फॉर यू सो यू शो दैट फॉर एग्जांपल यू यूज दिस एप्लीकेशन मूव्स दैट नाउ इज डिसकंटिन्यूड एंड आई वुड लाइक टू नो इफ यू हैव एनी सजेशन विद पॉसिबल अल्टरनेटिव्स और सम सॉफ्टवेयर दैट यू कैन सजेस्ट टू अस थैंक्स Actually, I don't. So over the last few weeks, I've tested a lot of tracking software. I also, for example, tried out the uh, Google for a few months now has this. I think it's called Timeline or something, and it's really, really, really bad. I mean, I was really. I mean, it's it's Google, so I was. Yeah, it's really, really bad, and I couldn't also find any alternatives. And what was especially interesting about um, Moose was that. Before they were bought by Facebook, they had a very strict privacy policy, and you were also able to download all of your data. Mm. And a lot of new companies, especially those um, like Fitbit and a lot of other companies, they don't allow you to, to download your complete data with all the metadata and everything. They just give you like small snippets and aggregated data and compressed data. So I haven't really found a proper solution yet. So if anybody has a tip on any. um spatial temporal trajectory tracking apps i'm happy to hear <laughs> okay so thank you sebastian thank you ans for your very nice presentation